Hey, hey friends, good morning. Uh, if we had not had a chance to meet, my name is Kenson. I serve as a pastor at Park Community Church at Bridgeport. Um, it's always an incredible joy to be able to spend a morning with you guys and just opening the word uh, together. So, uh, once again, we're in Luke chapter 9. Now, to get us started, I, w- I want to start with a story. You know, two weeks ago, my 14 year old son took the CTA bus for the very first time. Uh, he goes to school at Lane Tech, which is up on the north side in Roscoe Village, and we live right here in McKinley Park. Uh, so this is a brutal drive, brutal. So on good days, it's about 35 minutes one way, and on bad days, it can be over 60 minutes one way. So for mommy and daddy's sanity, we decided that, Evan, you have to learn to take the bus every once in a while. We need your help here, okay? So when I told my son that he was going to take the bus, immediately he was asking me, so are you going to go with me? Are you going to sit in the bus with me? You know? And I said to him, no. The whole point is that I don't have to go with you. That's the point. So to get ready, we looked at the bus route. We watched YouTube videos on how to ride CTA buses, how to pay with Venture Card, and I even waited at the bus stop with him. So on Thursday morning, he got on the bus, and let me just show you a picture of that, of that, of that, of that moment right there. And let me just say, he got to school okay, and praise God, he got back home okay. It was really fun to see my son spread his wings and learn how to take himself to school. You know, in our verses today, Jesus is teaching his disciples on how to spread their wings. So far, Jesus has been the one teaching and healing and the one doing the work in the gospel of Luke. And now in this moment, Jesus sends them out to go and do the work that he's been doing. What we have here is a picture of discipleship in action. Jesus is teaching them how to fly. You know, just like how you have baby birds, they don't fly immediately, but the parents take care of the younglings, you know, uh, on those early days and weeks. But in time, these babies need to come out of the safety of the nest. In the same way, Jesus is putting his disciples out of the safety of the nest, outside of their comfort zone to teach them something. And what is that? Jesus is teaching them to depend on God to provide. You know, we see this first when Jesus sends them out to proclaim the gospel to neighboring villages. He tells them to bring nothing extra with them. Instead, rely solely on the hospitality of strangers to take care of you. Oh, okay, that's a bit uncomfortable. And we see this faith challenge again. After Jesus teaches the multitude, it's late, the crowds are getting hungry. Jesus looks at his disciples and says, feed them. And the disciples are like, What? That's impossible to do. The disciples are pushed way past their comfort zone. What Jesus is doing with the disciples is teaching them to depend on God. Now, if I can just say that many of us struggle with this lesson, because we don't seek to grow in dependence, but independence. And this kind of makes sense, because ever since we've been kids, we've been taught to be self-sufficient, self-reliant. That's what it means to be mature. But the gospel turns this upside down, that maturity in the kingdom of God is childlike faith, that greatness before God is not when you can stand on your own two feet, but it's when you know to get on your knees. It's when you know to surrender yourself to someone greater. When the world sees dependence as a sign of weakness, in the kingdom of God, it's the opposite. Knowing that we can't make it on our own, knowing that we cannot save ourselves, and that we are dependent on God, that's acknowledging where our strength comes from. Our strength comes from the maker of heaven and earth. So with that, let's see how Jesus equips his disciples to depend on God. Let's see how he teaches them so that we too would learn to depend on God. So back in verses 1 and 6, and actually we can go back to the title, title slide here so you guys don't have to see my son for the next 20 minutes, you know? <laughs> as much as he would like that. Uh, Verses 1 and 6. And he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. And he said to them, verse 3, take nothing for your journey, no staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics. And whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there depart. And wherever they do not receive you, When you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. And they departed and went through the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. 
So Jesus sends his disciples on a short-term mission trip. He gives them authority and power over demonic spirits and to heal all kinds of diseases. So if I'm one of the disciples, that's pretty cool to have. But then Jesus says again in verse 3, Take nothing for this journey. No staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics. In essence, Jesus is saying, go now. Whoa, 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 whoa. Don't prepare for it. Don't take money. Don't take extra clothes. Don't take extra food with you. Just go. Now, I don't know how this is making you feel, but I'm getting a bit stressed out, okay? I I'm a planner, so when I take trips, I have a checklist. And when you have kids, you have checklists on top of checklists on top of checklists. For some of us here, we're such deep planners that we can't step outside the door unless we have an agenda for that day. But Jesus here tells his disciples, go, don't plan, don't prepare, don't go home and get your stuff, just go. Now, to be clear here, I don't think that Jesus is saying that he hates planning or preparing or organizing. We know this because in Luke chapter 22, Jesus sends his disciples out again, but this time he tells them to bring a money purse or, 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 or money bag with them. What we see in our verses is not a prescription of how we are to live or do ministry. Instead, Jesus is sending them out with just a shirt on their backs so that they would learn to trust the Lord. Go unprepared and watch what God will do for you. That is the training ground. And Jesus says, the way that you'll be provided for is by the hospitality of strangers. Now, what Jesus was doing here was leaning on the Jewish principle of hospitality. You know, back in these ancient times, they didn't have the infrastructure of like Holiday Inns or Best Westerns, or you couldn't download like an app on your phone where you can like get an Airbnb. So back then, travelers, the way that they were taken care of was through local hospitality. And in this case, Jewish people counted on the hospitality of their fellow Jews. So the plan is that these disciples would go and share the gospel in this neighboring town or village and in that home that they were staying in and in the home that they were staying in. And if that home welcomed them, if the town welcomed the message of Jesus, stay there. You're good. But if that town, if that family did not like the message of Jesus as Messiah and the disciples were kicked out of that home, Jesus says that if they do not receive you, shake the dust off your feet. Now, this was a very common idiom during that time. You know, Jewish rabbis believed that the very dust of Gentile lands, non-Jewish lands, it was defiled. So a lot of these Jewish rabbis, before they would re-enter Israel, they would take off their sandals first, dust it off, dust off all the, 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 the dirt from the unholy land. You know, to this day, Israel is called the Holy Land. It points back to when God in the burning bush told Moses to take off his sandals because he was on holy ground. So this gesture of shaking dust off your feet was that of judgment. You were declaring that this was a pagan town, that this was a pagan house. Now, now there's an important principle that we see here. God's patience will not last forever. Now, the reason I say this is because we have a tendency, including myself, to postpone repentance and say, you know, you know, I'll be committed to God tomorrow. You know, I'll change my ways tomorrow. You know, I'll give my life to Christ tomorrow, but just not yet. You know, God's patience will not endure forever. There is a limit to it. There, 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 there may come a time in a person's life when God says enough is enough. Do not test God's patience and grace because they continually do this over and over and over and over in your heart will not soften your heart towards Christ, but it will only harden it. It will only make it, a, it will callous your heart towards who he is. You know, we also see here that people will not always be receptive when we share the gospel with them, and sometimes it's okay to move on. Now, I know that's hard to hear, but this doesn't mean that you give up on the person or you stop praying for them, but we trust that God will bring someone else in their life to plant the gospel seed, to water that gospel seed, and that it will bring fruit. So once again here, Jesus is pushing his disciples outside their comfort zone. The usual resources that they would lean into to solve their problems, Jesus wants them to learn to lean into God. Now, what does this mean for us? You know, it means that dependence on God is something we grow in. And almost always it happens through challenges 
and hard circumstances. You know, I recently heard from Paul Tripp, a Christian author, say this. No one ever says that I've had the three of the most easy years of my life and I learned so much. That in these three easy years, I grew so much. It never happens that way. Hardship in the hands of the Redeemer is a workshop of His grace. What God did with the disciples is what God seeks to do with us. He allows challenges and hardships to expose areas of weakness around faith. You know, Bethany, let me ask you, when was the last time you felt that your faith was strong? When was the last time you knew without a shadow of a doubt that if God is for me, who can be against me? When was the last time you were so confident that God was able to take care of any issue, any problem, any concern that was weighing on you? When was the last time you felt bulletproof because you knew that you had the Holy Spirit residing in you? You know, I would say that the majority of of us, including myself, we are not living day to day in God's strength. So what happens is that these hard issues, they expose just how weak we are how we lack the strength to stand up against spiritual battles. This is why some of us were crushed by anxiety, by worry, by fear. Instead of our hearts being filled with love and and, and peace and contentment, we haven't yet learned the lesson of leaning on God's strength. You know, it's kind of like someone just saying to you right here, right now, to run a marathon, and you've never trained for it. You've never conditioned for a marathon. You, you You don't even have running shoes. That first mile of running is going to expose very quickly just how weak you are. The marathon of life, all the issues and circumstances that come with it, it exposes just how weak our faith is. So what are we to do with this? Well, what does Jesus do with his disciples? He has them put their faith into practice. They've spent enough time sitting and listening and observing, and now it's time for the rubber to meet the road. Instead of seeing the needs around you, disciples, respond to it. Instead of being served, serve others. Instead of hearing the gospel, proclaim the gospel. Trust God in the everyday moments to strengthen your faith so that you will strengthen your faith so that you would be strong for the harder moments to come. That our faith muscle is just like any other muscle in our body. It grows through resistance, right? It doesn't grow by sitting there and doing nothing. It grows through resistance. Our faith gets strengthened when we are willing to step into some resistance. Now, what does that mean? Well, putting your faith into action can mean a whole lot of things. It can mean something as simple as just serving, you know, like, you know, learning lear- what you learn on Sundays or in your, in your Bible study groups, you know, in your quiet times, you know, putting that into practice, you know, join a serving team, join the Awana team, you know, be, be generous, be, be forgiving, be hospitable, be bold in sharing your faith. Notice here, what's the training ground for the disciples? It's evangelism and mission. He tells them, go and proclaim the gospel. Let me just say, very few things make us depend on God more than sharing the gospel with others. You know, I remember that when I was studying to get my master's at Moody Bible Institute, one of the classes I took was evangelism and apologetics. Now, for the first three weeks of class, it was awesome. You know, we were learning all the different ways, you know, to share the gospel. You know, we were also doing some basic apologetics, defending the faith. And when you're amongst fellow Christians, that's fun. You know, you get to banter a little bit with each other. You know, you get to, you know, talk crazy. You know, like, it's, it's fun. But then the professor said, just so you guys know, next week, we're going to put this into practice, and we're going to share the gospel with people on the Chicago Red Line. And I was like, oh, no. And I prayed that week that, God, would you please make me sick so I can't go to school? I really don't want to do this. But, you know, and I, I got to school. And we started walking from Moody to the Chicago Red Line. And let me tell you something. I have never prayed so hard in my life. I was sweating. And then when we got to the platform of where the trains are, and the whole idea is that every train comes like every, like, four to five minutes. So that's a perfect amount of time to share your testimony, to share the gospel. And I'm going to tell you, we're down on the platform and I'm hiding behind a pillar. And all I kept saying is that, God, I need you. 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 Right? Nothing quite like sharing your faith to really strengthen those faith muscles. 
Can I just say that what Jesus did with the disciples, he does with us. He also sends us to. In John 20, 21, Jesus says about the church, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. 2 Corinthians 5, 20, the Apostle Paul says, we are ambassadors for Christ. Jesus sends us to others. He sends us in our neighborhoods. He sends us to our neighbors, in our offices, in our schools, in our universities, in our city, and in our world. Here's the point. If we want to learn to depend on God more, every day we need to put our faith into practice. Every day we need to be willing to step out of the comfort zone. Our faith muscle, just like any other muscle, has to be nurtured, it has to be developed, it has to face some resistance. Put your faith into practice. You know, when Jesus tells his disciples, I'm going to send you out, but I'm going to send you with nothing but the power of God, this made the disciples nervous. It makes me nervous to live boldly for Jesus. But here's the thing. When Jesus sends them out with nothing but the power of God, he sends them out with everything they needed. That's the lesson he wanted them to learn. That's the lesson we need to learn. So with that, let's go ahead and jump to verse 10, because Jesus is not done teaching yet, and the feeding of the 5,000. Now, of all the miracles that Jesus performed, there's only two that's recorded in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. One is the resurrection, and the other one is the feeding of the 5,000. And as we'll see here, Jesus continues to teach this lesson on dependence. Verse 10, on their return from this short-term mission trip, the apostles told him all that they had done, and Jesus took them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethsaida. Now notice that after the disciples come back from this evangelism trip, Jesus pulls them away from the work to rest and process. This is a beautiful example of how Jesus values soul care and how we can have longevity in ministry. That it's not always about doing for Jesus, but it's first being with Jesus. So verse 11, when the crowds learned it, so even though they were on this retreat, the crowds find out, ah, there's Jesus, so it didn't last very long. They followed him, and Jesus welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God, cured all who had need of healing. Now the day began to wear away, and the twelve came to Jesus and said, Send the crowd away and go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and get provisions, for we are in a desolate place. But Jesus said to them, You give them something to eat. They said, We have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless we are to go and buy food for all these people, for there are about 5,000 men. And he said to the disciples, Have them sit in groups of 50 each. And they did so, and he had them all sit down. And taking the five loaves and two fish, Jesus looked up to heaven and said a blessing over them. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples and set, uh, to set before the crowd. And they all ate and were satisfied. And what was left over was picked up 12 baskets of broken pieces. So the disciples, they have come back from relying on the power of God, and now they're faced with another need. It's getting late, the crowd's hungry. Jesus says, feed them. Jesus is putting another faith challenge before them. And their immediate response is, no way. It's impossible. We can't feed the multitude. It says here that it was about 5,000 men, which meant that this is closer to maybe 15 to 20,000 people if you include children and, and, and women. So this is about the size of the United Center. So Jesus, right, the problem is obvious. It's too many people. The day is drawing near. We don't have the time. We don't have the money. The stores are closed, right? And, and look at the food that we had that we stole from this little boy. Five loaves of bread and two fish. Right? This is impossible. Even if we had the money, even if we could go into the store, even if we had enough time, there wouldn't be enough food to feed all these people. It's impossible. What we see here is that when Jesus asked them to solve this problem, their first response was to look for a natural solution as opposed to a supernatural solution. Now, this is where the irony kicks in. 
Because the disciples just experienced the God, God, God at work in their lives. They were healing people, casting out demons. No doubt they were seeing people come to faith. Incredible stuff. And at this retreat at Bethsaida that they were having, just like any other like, type of like, short-term mission trip, you come back together, you process, oh man, God did all these wonderful things. Let me share you story after story after story. God's awesome. But the disciples now are faced with a new need, a new concern, a new challenge, and they're like, no way. It, it can't happen. can't happen at all. They are literally in the presence of the Son of God who has all power and all authority, and all they can think is to find the nearest Marianos to solve their problems. The mistake the disciples made, and one that we make all the time, is that we can leave God out of the equation in our lives that we look at our problems and all we can think of is natural solutions. You know, we see our relationship problems and we put all our hope in a counselor or, 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 or we just give up hope and, and we look towards separation, never considering what God can do. You know, we look at our physical problems and we put our solutions in medicine and treatments, never putting God into the equation. We look at our financial problems and we look to guys like Dave Ramsey or some financial coach to get us out of it, never asking what God can do. Now, please hear me. I'm not bashing on these other things. Counseling, medicine, you know, coaching, you know, Excel spreadsheets, you know, they're all good and helpful. I have used them all. But the caution here is that we can be so focused on what is, on fr what is in front of us that we can forget to turn our eyes upward. You know, Jesus here, notice, takes what little they have and looks up to God for blessing. Jesus invites God into the equation of their situation. You know, the Apostle Paul says this in Ephesians 3, a very familiar verse here. Paul says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or think, according to the power within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus for all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Now, for some of the churches, you know, that you guys have been going to in, in your past history, maybe here at Bethany, there's been times maybe at the very end with the benediction, they would recite this verse as a word of blessing, you know, as you head back into the world. And the reason Ephesians 3 gets re re repeated is because as you engage in your home, in your work, in your neighborhood, you do so through the power of what God can do for the glory of His name. Now, what's astounding about this verse in Ephesians 3 is that it says that to him who's able to do far more abundantly than we can ask or think. You know, what this is saying here is that even when we pray for God to work, our prayers will always be too small because God can do more than what we can ever, ever imagine. You know, Bethany, whatever issue you're facing right now, God can do more. You know, whatever it is that has your marriage on the rocks, God can do more. Whatever has you miserable at work, God can do more. Whatever has you lonely, God can do more. Whatever it is that has you angry, sad, scared, frustrated, God can do more. God offers to those who depend on him healing, restoration, new hearts, new lives, new minds, new relationships, a new start. Do not leave God out of the equation. God can do more. Now, let me just say, I, I get it. This sounds nice. It's easy to say it from this nice little pulpit here. But man, this stuff is hard. Depending on God feels risky. What if God doesn't? provide? What if I'm left at a worse place than I was before? You know, it's when you have these kind of crossroads of faith in your life, this is when we need to preach the gospel to ourselves. That, that we need to remind ourselves that if God went through all the trouble of sending his one and only son to shed his blood and to adopt us into the family of God, if he spent all this trouble paying for the debt of our sin, how would he also not graciously meet us in all areas of our lives? Romans chapter 8, verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he also, not, also with him graciously give us all things? 
Bethany, the same Jesus who provided for thousands upon thousands who are hungry is the same Jesus who seeks to meet our needs when we come to him today. Depend on him. You know, in our verses, when after everything is said and done, everyone had their fill of food, and there was actually leftovers. And we read specifically that there were 12 baskets of leftovers. How many disciples are there? 12 disciples. I think the disciples learned a lesson. God can do more. When our problems are put next to the normity of God, it's nothing. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 19, verse 26, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. You know, let me just close with this, uh, with this story here. You know, at Park Community Church Bridgeport, um, the church that I pastor, uh, next month we'll be celebrating uh, our one-year anniversary of our ministry center. So just a little background on us. Uh, we meet at an art center, uh, and on Sundays we just rent out on Sunday mornings. Like, we just, we lease on Sunday mornings uh, for, our, for our worship services. Um, so yeah, so in that building, um, we currently have a ministry center that we call the Bridge uh, that has been such a blessing for us in the church. Uh, we've been able to have like vacation Bible school, you know, numerous classes. Uh, we've been able to bless, you know, the, the region and other parachurch ministries. We've had worship nights, potlucks, and we've been able to have classrooms uh, for our kids' ministry. So this ministry center has been such a huge blessing uh, for a church that doesn't have its own building. So it's been really nice to have this uh, ministry center. But the journey to get to the bridge, our ministry center, was very stressful, very challenging. You know, last year, as we were heading to contract negotiations, I really felt that our church, Park Bridgeport, was going to be homeless. And there was numerous factors that made it impossible for us to remain at the art center. First, our children's ministry was not meeting in classrooms, they were meeting in a hallway with no air conditioning on the third floor, okay? That, it, it, was, it was miserable and it was chaotic. You know, we used to have, you know, classrooms, you know, for, for our kids' ministry on the first floor of the building, but the Art Center took that away from us. We also used to have janitorial help to help us clean up on Sundays and to help us tear down. That was taken from us. The art center was planning events on Sunday mornings that forced us to cancel or move our worship gatherings with very short notice. There were some Sundays uh, last year where as we were singing the last song, we were starting to take down our monitors and our speakers because another event was coming into the building and we were getting kicked out. And finally, there was word that our lease rate would substantially increase. I'm going to tell you, a little over a year ago, I was, I was discouraged scared and frustrated. You know, I reached out to everyone in the Bridgeport neighborhood, every school, every event center, you know, every empty building space, asking, hey, would you want to have a church meet here, this and that, and nothing was working out. And, and I started to doubt, man, God, do you, do you want us here in Bridgeport? You know, did we do something wrong as a church? Did we not pray enough? Did, did we not give enough? So as leaders and members of the church, we prayed, and 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 we're just trusting God, man. If, if you planted us here, you'll find a way for us to continue. So it was time for contract negotiations, and we're at a local coffee shop in Bridgeport, and I was sitting there with the property owner, and I was ready for him to tell us it's time to go. I even had on a piece of paper how I thought the transition plan could work, you know, give us a six-month, you know, window to move out, you know, give us a month-to-month -month lease, you know, here, I've done the math, this is the very most that we can pay to stay in the art center. You know, I did all of that stuff, so, so, so I had that on a piece of paper, and let me just say, this is where God did more. Not only did the property owner not kick us out, he offered a five-year lease to us without raising rent. I was like, oh my goodness, okay? Don't clap too soon, okay, because the story gets better, okay? Now, I'm like, I'm like, whoa, okay, whoa, whoa, this is great. And the owner just said to me, he says that, you know what, like, we know the work that you guys are doing in the neighborhood, and we would love our building, our organization to be associated with your organization, so we want you here. That's awesome. But that still didn't solve one of our greatest non-negotiables. Our kids cannot meet in the hallway. 
It's just, our families were leaving left and right. They just, I, I, I wanted to leave, and I'm the pastor of the church, you know? Like, it, it, was a, it was a miserable situation, so we needed that. And once again, this is where God did more. On top of that, the art center said, on this five-year lease, we also want to offer you a 3,000-square-foot space for you to use 24-7. It'll have its own AC and heat, its kitchenette, its bathrooms, its own bathrooms, classrooms for kids, and, and, you would, and we would renovate the space for our need, for your needs. But here's the kicker. We would need to raise $200,000 to see this happen. And immediately my heart dropped again, and I said to God, God, you're such a tease here because this feels so impossible. $200,000 is basically half of our yearly ministry budget, half of it. And as a Bridgeport church, we have never, ever done a giving campaign. And frankly speaking, we're not the wealthiest demographic, okay? Most of our folks are, live in Bridgeport, McKinley Park, you know, Chinatown, Armour Square area. We're, it's not like we're Streeterville or we're Gold Coast. We're, we're not that. But we cast the vision for what God can do. And as a Bridgeport family... We raised $100,000, and our Park family of churches donated another $100,000. Within four weeks, we raised every dollar we needed to continue the gospel work in Bridgeport. Praise God for that. You. you know, I just want to share with you guys that every time I go into our ministry center and walk in there, you know, I love it. Not so much because of the ministry opportunities that it gives us, which is great, and not just because it makes ministry planning easier, which is, which is really nice. You know, I love the bridge. I love our ministry center because it's a testimony that God can do more. You know, that even though I didn't think we had enough, that we were out of options, almost everyone was turning us away, God supernaturally met our need. God can do more more. Bethany, let's learn to depend on him. Amen. Amen. Let's, let's bow our heads. Let's pray. Father God, I know that for some of us sitting here today, yeah, man, we, we feel really challenged. You know, we feel anxious about things. We're wrestling with decisions that we just don't know what to do. And life is just, frankly speaking, it's just really hard. Father God, I, I pray that in these moments that we would not run from you, but Father, that we would see the invitation of Jesus here, is that we would run to you. And that we would see the beauty of your wisdom, the beauty of your strength, the beauty of your love, and how, God, that, that, is, that is all we need to be sustained and to continue to walk um, in our faith journey with you. God, I pray Lord, that you would help us to be a church that would be so dependent on you. That God, that we would be able to experience the joy of what it means and what it looks like when you do answer prayers because God, we are praying because we do need you. And God, I pray Lord, that you would forgive us of, of any self-reliance or any pride that so easily creeps up in all of our hearts. But Father, that you would remind us again that God, that it's in Christ we can let go of control we can let go of all the, 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 the planning and organizing, you know, to have things our way and to know that, that God, that you are greater. That God, that there is no situation that we face, there's no problems that's before us, that God, that you do not walk with us through. So God, help us to know that, help us to trust in that. And Father, I also do pray that we know in the Gospel of John that in the story of the feeding of the 5,000, that this is where Jesus teaches that he is the bread of life. So Father, through the feeding of their tummies, God, you used it to teach how you meet us at our greatest need, which is our relationship with you. So, Father, for any of us here who do not know you as Lord and Savior, that, God, that today in this moment, you would draw us to you uh, for our salvation uh, and that we will call you and know that you can meet us in all our needs, not just physically, but, God, for all eternity by having a relationship with God. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.